Hello everyone, I'm here today with Jeannie Ziano. She's a political science professor at Iona College and you're basically who everyone wants to go to when they want to talk politics. I mean, you were just holding a town hall with PIX11 News, so thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's great to talk to you. Great, thank you. So I want to start off, obviously we're in the middle of an election season. Um, we're almost seven months away from the votes and we have Trump, Cruz, Kasich, and obviously Bernie Sanders and Clinton. So keeping the math in mind, who is looking to get the nomination so far? That's the big question, right? Yeah. You know, we are we are in mid-April, so mm -hmm. we are about a week away from the New York primary, and I think a lot of it depends on what happens in the New York primary. And then, of course, we go into the northeastern states right after that, and then California, the delegate-rich California mm -hmm. on June 7th, which is the big get on the delegates. So, in terms of forecasting that out, I think if you go out by the math, as you mentioned uh, specifically, on the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton has the, the numbers. Yeah. And she looks to probably win this thing, although we have to say Bernie Sanders has won the last seven out of the eight contests. So again, a lot of it on the Democratic side depends on what happens in New York. The polls show she is leading in a double digit, uh, in double digit margin. So it'll probably be Hillary Clinton. And mathematically, if you were on the Republican side, if you're looking at that race, you have to say that Donald Trump is well ahead on the delegate count. Second is Ted Cruz. And then John Kasich is a distant fourth behind Marco Rubio, who pulled out of the race. So, you know, neither Ted Cruz nor John Kasich can win this thing without going to a contested convention. Donald Trump still can although it looks increasingly unlikely because he would have to win about 61% of the remaining delegates to get the nomination without going to a contested convention. So that's how it's shaping up on both sides. And again, it's going to depend an awful lot on what happens April 19th. And then as we go into those Northeastern and those big states like Pennsylvania and the delegate-rich California in June. Mm -hmm. What are the chances of this contested convention happening? I, I mean, I know Kasich is really holding on to that. Yeah, Kasich is holding on to it. Certainly also is Ted Cruz, right? Because neither one of them ha can mathematically capture the 1237 needed. So it is looking increasingly likely. It became more probable after Ted Cruz won the Wisconsin primary. Mm -hmm. um, but the, we have to remember that the map does favor and the calendar favors Donald Trump going into New York and then to the Northeast states. So he has that advantage. But we haven't had a contested convention in the United States since the 1950s. Almost, it's, yeah. it's amazing, Over right? Minutes. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're looking at decades. And so if we were to go to a contested convention, it would be fascinating for those of us who are political junkies and those of us in the media who love these things because we've never actually seen a televised con contested convention. Television, the minute television came on the scene, parties stopped holding contested conventions mm -hmm. because, of course, it's not a pretty thing to broadcast to the American public. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably, if we have one, going to be a lot of what we hear. The American public will, I think, be astounded by how, how this actually works because it's not a pretty process to watch. It'll be a very, very um, noisy, a very, very um, ugly process, and we are more hearing- More than it already is, More basically. than it already <laughs> is, and we're hearing it may even involve, you know, there's threats of violence, there's certainly yeah. gonna be protests. So we haven't seen anything like this in the United States since the 1950s, so it will be, uh, a difficult thing to watch, I think. Ameri Do you think America's prepared for something like that? I don't see how we could be because we haven't been through it recently. We've never had, no, I'm, I'm talking about television, but now we have Twitter, now we have Instagram, Snapchat, social all the media. social media. I mean, you imagine covering this and, and seeing about it and reading about it and hearing about it. Not to mention the fact that now the Republican Party has got to explain why they put us through these months and months and months of votes when the person who got the most votes may not even get the nomination. And of course, that's what Donald Trump has been out there saying. And the Republican Party says, well, those are the rules. But it's going to be tough for them to explain to people why the person who got the most votes is not going to be, or may not be, we should say, the nominee. So that's going to be a tough thing for them. Speaking of television, um, a lot of people are saying that the media is running this election. I mean, during debates, CNN, Fox, all those news organizations, they don't seem to be giving enough camera time to guys like Kasich. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a, a point John Kasich has been making, a mm -hmm. point Bernie Sanders on the other side has been has been making. He had protesters go to CNN not long ago, recently actually, and make that case that they are not getting the coverage they deserve. And of course, you know, there is truth to that. The media only covers people who are good television or 
primarily covers people who are good television or good entertainment, we should say, political entertainment. And you can't, in my mind, you can't really fault the media for that. When you are a media organization, your number one priority has got to be ratings. And to get ratings, you need to attract viewers. So, you know, I always find it interesting that we blame the media for that when, in fact, if the American public wasn't keen on watching that, they would be putting something else on. Exactly. So, you know, I think we do have to be cognizant of that. Do I wish that they were doing a different, you know, doing it differently? Yes. And do I think it would be better for democracy? Yes. But I also don't think you can ask people, people or media interests or corporations to act against their own interests. So I think if you want different types of coverage, you have to think about a different media structure. And those are things like government-run media like the BBC or NPR, that's where you get that kind of more policy-rich yeah. coverage. But of course, they also don't get the kind of viewers you get. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword for the media. And I think, you know, I do a lot of work with the media and, you know, yeah, they don't give the best coverage. There's some very good coverage out there, but you also have a media that is, you know, primarily motivated by a need to get ratings. Mm -hmm. Well, it's no secret that Bernie Sanders is appealing to millennial voters. What do you think makes him so popular with the millennial vote? And do you think his whole idea of becoming a socialist society can work in America? Yeah, he has. It's been astounding. I've been working the exit and the entrance polls in these primaries and caucus states. And what you see when you look at the polls, sometimes he's coming in 80% to 20% when you're talking about young people. And of course, when you look at older people, they're going about in the same margin to Hillary Clinton. So there's a huge generational split or a generational gap, if you will. Um, and part of what I think it is, is that Bernie Sanders is seen as somebody who's authentic, somebody who speaks from his heart, somebody who cares about issues that matter to young people. And, you know, I believe that Hillary Clinton does as well, but she doesn't make the case in the same way a Bernie Sanders does. And she's certainly seen by young people and older people as a more establishment candidate, if you will. And so because of that, you know, she's not as attractive to young people. And I'm astounded by how hard she has to work to make that case. I mean, you think about it, Hillary Clinton, if she gets the nominee, nomination, will be the first female nominee of a major party in the United States ever in American history. Now, we've had Countries around the world have elected prime ministers and president and female leaders. We never have in the United States. We've never even had a nominee. And yet that message doesn't seem to resonate with young people as much as perhaps we thought it might, even with young women. So she has to work really hard to gain the trust of young people. Um, and part of that is going to depend on how this race shapes out. And to your question about Bernie Sanders' uh, democratic socialist um, vision, I do think that some of the things he talks about are doable in this country. The problem is going to be if he faces, if he was the president and faced a Republican Senate and House, which we've had for some years now, would he be able to fulfill that goal? Probably not. So I think, you know, he has a tough road ahead if he becomes president, achieving these kinds of dreams. And of course, young people might be particularly frustrated if they elect him to office and he can't do everything he's promised to do. And that's you know kind of the, the old story of American exactly. presidential politics. Do you think he'll run into a lot of problems with the Congress that he'll be working with, implementing his socialist ideas? If the Congress is run by Republicans, absolutely. And of course, Republicans have the House by a huge margin following the 2014 midterm. So it's unlikely that they will lose the House, very mm -hmm. unlikely. You know, Democrats may make gains there, may not. You know, they could, Democrats could pick up the Senate. There's a chance for them to do that. It depends on turnout. If they did that, you know, he's likely facing, if he's the president, a narrowly Democratic Senate and certainly a House or a narrowly Republican Senate and certainly a Republican House. Either way, to make those kinds of dramatic changes in American politics is very hard. I mean, we can just ask President Obama, who came in in 2008 and has been struggling ever since to fulfill many of the promises he made. He was able to pass health care, not in the way he wanted or not the, the kind of policy he envisioned, but he was able to get it through. But let's not forget, he was also working with a Democratic Congress at that point. So yeah, it's a tough road ahead for either Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton facing a Republican, a Republican Congress if the Democrats win the presidency again. You know, what I found interesting was when Clinton was running against Obama, she actually did better with millennial voters. But this time around, Hillary Clinton used to get the African-American majority vote. 
Despite Bernie having been an advocate for African American rights, he even was arrested once at a segregation protest in the 60s. Why do you think this is? You know, it's such a good question. Um, Hillary Clinton, I think, has done a masterful job of bringing together or bringing back President Obama's coalition. And part of that, I think, is because she has really embraced President Obama and his policies. And of course, President Obama is very, very popular with Democrats and very, very popular with African Americans on the Demo in the Democratic Party. So I think on the one hand, because she worked with President Obama as his Secretary of State, because she has embraced him and his policies in a way Bernie Sanders has not, I think that has helped her pull that vote. I also think it's because Bill Clinton has a legacy. You know, we used to talk about Bill Clinton as the first black president. Um, you know, and, and the reason was, of course, because many African Americans felt that this, you know, former governor from Arkansas who eventually made it to the White House did pass policies and did make strides that they were hoping to be made in, when he was president in the 1990s. And so the African-American community has long been, you know, uh, supportive of the Clintons. You know, it's no surprise that the Clinton Foundation is headquartered in Harlem. I mean, that's not a surprise. This is somebody who is, you know, in Bill Clinton, along with Hillary Clinton, has done a lot of work for that community. And so that, too, I think helps explain it. Um, and also, I think, you know, that is an important constituency for the Democratic establishment, and she is the Democratic establishment. So I think for all those reasons, Bernie Sanders has had a tough time breaking through. Um, he's done better, we should say, in the Northeast, in the Northern states than he did in the Southern states, but she's particularly strong with African Americans in the Southern states. We're getting closer to finding out, if nominated, who would the candidates want as their VP. Trump said that he was leaning towards Rubio and maybe even Kasich, but Kasich said that there's no way that he wants to be VP. Who do you think would be some smart choices? You know, I think um, for Donald Trump, I think both Marco Rubio and John Kasich would be smart choices. I think, you know, in particular, John Kasich, although, of course, he's still running. He's yes. never going to admit <laughs> he would want to be second, um, and he may not want to be. But um, I think, you know, for Donald Trump, I think you need a, an establishment figure within the Republican Party who's strong on policy and well-respected. I think, you know, partly what you want to do when you're choosing a vice president is balance out the ticket. Sometimes you do that geographically to win an important state like Florida. So if he was able to get Rubio on his ticket, it might help him with Florida. Similarly, John Kasich, Ohio, you don't win the presidency without winning Ohio in the general if you're a Republican. So geographically that balances. And I also think you want somebody who has the expertise, inside knowledge about how Washington works, which somebody like John Kasich certainly does. Um, and there's other figures that he could choose that like that along those lines. So I think that's what they're looking for. I think, you know, if you ask somebody like a Hillary Clinton or you ask somebody like Bernie Sanders, they're equally going to be trying to balance out the ticket. You know, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton may be looking for somebody who helps ensure that they get the African-American or Latino vote. They may choose somebody from a key state that they need to win like a Texas, or, or they want to win, I should say, like a Florida or Texas, Ohio, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll all be trying to balance out the ticket. And also, if you're, you know, if you think back to John McCain's choice of Sarah Palin, for instance, I mean, nobody even knew outside of Alaska no. who she was at that point. And the reason he chose her was because his campaign at that time was floundering and he needed kind of a lift and a spark. And we forget that in the first few weeks when she was chosen, she gave his campaign that lift. It started to drag a little bit as she got better known and out there more, but she was a spark that he needed. So if any of these campaigns feel as they go closer to the convention that they're starting to lag a little bit, you can look for somebody kind of new and exciting and fresh in that way. So that's always gonna be a really, really interesting choice. And of course, if we're going to a contested convention, we could have three candidates in Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and John Kasich all choosing vice presidential nominees, which would be fascinating. <laughs> um, Sarah Palin did endorse Donald Trump. Do you think that helped his election? You know, I don't think her, her endorsement, I think initially it was, you know, a way to shore up his base. I don't think it changed many minds. And I, you know, I do think he struggles with women. In fact, I don't think it, I know it. And we look at the Definitely. polls, he's struggled with women. But I don't think Sarah Palin is the surrogate he needs out there to attract more moderate women. So 
yes, I think the endorsement helped shore up a base that was already with him, but I think what he really needs is he really needs to get well-respected women within the Republican Party, whether it's a Nick, Nikki Haley, whether it's a Susanna Martinez, or some of these other folks that are really well-respected policy people in elected positions within the establishment who can help bring women back into the fold, bring Republican women back, because of course he is losing big when it comes to females, 80 to 20%. You cannot win the election when your negatives with women are that high. This whole idea of donations, I mean, Trump basically feeds on the fact that he is not taking money from the big corporations, the lobbyists, but there's also this idea that because he has so much money, he's somehow rigging his votes. What do you think about this? You know, it has been a selling point, I think a big selling point with his supporters that he is, you know, independently wealthy and he doesn't need to rely on big donors to fund this campaign. Mm -hmm. He is still raising money, although he denies it, um, and he hasn't spent a lot of his own because he's gotten a lot of free media. That said, I think this issue speaks more to the fact that we really do need campaign finance reform in this country. You shouldn't only have to rely on wealthy people to run for office so that you can ensure that your candidates are not beholden to big interests. We should have campaign finance reform, which allows us to take big money out of our campaigns and allows almost anyone who can run their campaign to be seen as independent. And that's something we don't have at this point. In fact, yesterday there was just a huge rally in Washington, D.C., protesting big money in politics by two groups, uh, coalitions of two groups, Democracy Spring and Democracy Awakening. And their message is really about the need to get money out of politics, including out of campaigns. So on the one hand, it is attractive to many supporters that Donald Trump's independently wealthy, but I think it raises a troubling question. Why would we have a system in which only the independently wealthy can be seen as independent? in a political context. And if that's the case, you need campaign finance reform to fix that system. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in my mind, Donald Trump hasn't gone to that point. He's talked about how he can be trusted, but he hasn't said about talked about fixing a system to ensure everybody can run and be independent of big mm -hmm. money. And that's what, you know, I think something he would be well served to talk about and he hasn't really addressed at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of news organizations are saying that Trump should be disqualified from many of the things that he said in, during this election season. They're saying that he shouldn't be running for president. He doesn't have any good things to say. And what he said about Muslims, what he's been saying about women, why do you think that is? Um, I, I don't know why Donald Trump does what he does. <laughs> if I only knew. Um, he has used um, really charged rhetoric that you know, I think has frightened a lot of people, and rightly so. I mean, we were talking about the conventions. One of his surrogates went out and, went out and talked about violence at the convention. That's a very, very scary proposition. And I absolutely agree with those critics who say that the rhetoric has no place in American politics. Now, can you stop him from saying that? Absolutely not. He's got a First Amendment right to speak. But that doesn't mean we need to endorse it. And I think the message would be that media outlets need to call him out on these claims, that people need to challenge these claims. Because of course, again, you can't expect the media to be the only institution out there doing that. And I will tell you in the media's defense, we have more fact checkers out there now than we ever have. We, there has been a lot of criticism of Donald Trump on the one hand by the media, but by the same token, a lot of that gets drowned out by Donald Trump himself, who's really, you know, a very entertaining figure, if nothing mm -hmm. else. So, you know, it's a very complicated question, but I do think that it sends a message. I mean, when you have people out there saying that they don't know if they can allow their young children to watch a political debate because it sounds like there's bullying going on during it, that's a really problematic thing to have in any political realm, and we shouldn't have it. And you know, addressing it though is a completely different issue. And one way to do it is quite frankly, shaming people into not behaving in that way. It hasn't worked in the case mm -hmm. of Donald Trump. And the more people vote for him, the more likely we're going to have this type of behavior from other people because it has quote unquote worked. And that's particularly troubling, I think, as we yeah. go forward. You know, the media hasn't talked about it much anymore, but how do you think Clinton's cases, for example, the Benghazi, the whole email scandal, how do you think that's going to affect her and how is it affecting her election and being elected for president? On the Democratic side, it hasn't impacted her much. She is something that Democrats are not particularly concerned about, 
But I think in the general election, depending on what happens, now we still don't know. We understand she's going to be interviewed. We understand there's 120 to 150 FBI agents working this case. If she was to be indicted, for instance, and that's a big if because there's no, we don't know that yet, that would be, you know, I think a huge, huge uh, earth shattering moment in the campaign. Could somebody continue to run if they were under indictment, even for a misdemeanor? I think that's a big, big question. Again, that's a big if because we don't know that, that would happen. Mm-hmm. But I think in the general election, the question's not so much about Benghazi because Benghazi is not something that has hurt Hillary Clinton. She has, you know, been before the committee a few times. Every time she has come out stronger than she went in. But the emails issue, I think, does raise questions about her trustworthiness, does raise questions, quite frankly, about her decision making. You know, here's somebody who thought it was possible she was going to run for president. If you understand you might do that, why do you then decide to set up a private server in your home? That's the question still hasn't been answered. What was on that private Mm -hmm. server? Um, You know, you then rob us as scholars and as Americans, quite frankly, of the information that we have every right to access from our public officials when you are Secretary of State and that information is no longer accessible. Those are real questions that I think people will ask. Do I think it is going to take her campaign down? I don't think there's any indication of that at this point, but again, it depends on what happens with the investigation and you know how that proceeds. And I think we won't know that probably for a few months, if not longer. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that Trump is a businessman, but his main business partner has always been his daughter, Ivanka Trump. And she hasn't really, she stayed out of the the political limelight as as far as her father. But people are saying that Trump does go to Ivanka for most issues, if not all of them. Do you think the media should be placing more emphasis on Ivanka and we should be looking at her more? You know, I think that she is. What we understand is she is a key figure in his life in terms of his, you know, political advisors, if not, as you mentioned, one of the key people that he trusts. And I think that's true with all candidates. They have, I'm sure his wife as well is a key advisor. They have spouses, they have family members, they have fathers and mothers and people that they really look to for not just support, but also for political advice. So I don't think it's any different than Hillary Clinton going to Bill Clinton for advice. You know, do I think the media needs to cast a a spotlight on her? Not necessarily, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that this is somebody in Ivanka Trump who has incredible influence over this potential nominee to the Republican Party. Um, You're right, she has stayed out of the political limelight. She's certainly been in the limelight. She's stayed out of the political limelight. Um, I think, you know, what is fascinating about their relationship is that while we do often see it with spouses, we do see it sometimes with, you know, children and parents, we don't often see it the other way with a a parent relying on a child. And I think it's it's fascinating. And I also think just for for him strategically, because he does need to attract women, I think it would be in the campaign's interest to highlight the fact that you know one of the key people in his life that he depends on is this very smart businesswoman who he raised and raised to be what we understand a fine young woman and businesswoman in her own right so i think that would help him certainly and those are the kind of people i think he would probably do better off having out on his surrogates with him rather than necessarily just a sarah palin so i, I think she could be very, very useful to the campaign if she was more public you know in the same way maybe Chelsea Clinton has tried to be supportive of and public for her mother, um, although I think their relationship is a little bit different in that regard. Mm There is a third party, the Libertarian Party, that people can vote for um, on their ballots. Gary Johnson, I know, is running Austin Peterson and John McAfee. But it doesn't get a lot of media attention at all. Why do you think this is? Can you explain the Libertarian Party a little more? Yeah, the Libertarian Party, uh, Gary Johnson in particular, is is very, very popular with many young people, we should say, in part because the Libertarian Party has a message that is appealing. It's, you know, essentially a fiscally, if you will, more conservative message and a socially, if you will, more liberal message. And of course, libertarians want to keep government out of your pocketbook, out of your bedroom, mm-hmm. out of your life as much as possible. So it's a more limited role for the government. And that's something that is very popular with a lot of people, particularly young people. And I think, you know, I'm so glad you raised that because I think the media doesn't give it as much attention in part because the way our system works 
it's very, very difficult for third parties to win. So it's very unlikely that the Libertarian Party will make much headway in this election. But I also think it's something that should be highlighted more because the message itself is appealing to people, particularly now, who are discontented with the major political parties and looking for an alternative. The Libertarian Party, just like the Green Party and some of the other parties that are out there, they do have messages to send. They do have a lot to offer. Until we change the way we elect presidents or our elections in general, however, it's un highly unlikely, again, that they will make much headway at the national level. And so if people are attracted to their message and want to change that, they absolutely should get involved in changing the rules of the game and the way in which we elect presidents, because otherwise those messages are completely or almost completely drowned out. And certainly if the Republicans go to a contested convention and Donald Trump doesn't get the nomination, there's a threat he could run as a third party. Um, would he make be able to make much headway? He'd get a lot of media attention, but the idea that he would be able to win 270 electoral votes is you know, almost impossible in the same way Gary Johnson faces this uphill battle. So mm -hmm. I hope people check out what Gary Johnson has to say and, and the others who are running because they really do have an appealing message to many, many people who are not satisfied with either of the other two major political parties. Great. Thank I want to thank you for being with me here today. Thank you for having me. It's for fun. North, for North <laughs> Avenue Nation, I'm Rala Kathawari.